where uh, existing code is an impediment to salmon restoration efforts that the county is undertaking. Um, in, in some, sometimes we're our own worst enemy uh, in terms of doing things like removing culverts and replacing them with things that would let salmon access habitat or undertaking restoration projects. Um, and so when we look at the things that are bottlenecks in those projects, it's often things like clearing and grading permits with the county rather than any state permitting um, requirements. Uh, and so um, we're gonna be doing some really focused work over the next couple of years to remove those uh, in collaboration with DNRP. Um, and then we're just, uh, we're continuing. We got more money for participatory budgeting. We're gonna continue doing that work. We're gonna of course be out in community uh, I think folks on in this group were tracking our work around community needs lists. We'll be doing another round of um, community engagement around community needs lists and trying to make that process work better uh, as it will inform the next biennial budget. Um, there is, of course, lots more going on, but those are the top of mind things. Um, and on Vasham, we'll be rolling out garbage cans pretty quick here. Um, I know that makes David happy. Uh, that's imminent. I can't give you an exact timeline, but before the end of the year or shortly thereafter is my expectation. Uh, and then we're doing a lot of, you know, work all over the place. Um, you know, one area where I've been spending a lot of time is in the unincorporated areas of Grotto and um, Bering that were impacted in the late summer, early fall by the Bolt Creek fire. Um, those two communities were ordered to evacuate. And since then people are back, but the challenge for them now is in the wake of that wildfire, there's a real risk of um, landslides, debris flows from the burned area above those communities. And that may not seem like something that's relevant to Vashon, but I think the one thing that uh, I'm seeing in my brief tenure here uh, and colleagues of mine who've worked in forestry in Western Washington for most of their career is we just haven't in our lifetime seen these kinds of fires on this side of the mountain. And I think for all rural unincorporated areas, it's just, something to be mindful of. And if you um, live in, you know, a rural forested area, uh, be, be well aware of the risks and take advantage of um, the FireWise program that's hosted by the King Conservation District. And they have folks who can come in and give you, you know, good advice on uh, making your home more resilient to wildfire. Um, things like just clearing brush back, um, thinking about what's up against your house, things like wood piles, creating separation, thinking about landscaping. Um, I think it's going to be uh, something that we're going to be dealing with in rural unincorporated King County for the, you know, for the future. And, uh, and Vashon is a community that has had small wildfires in the past and may very well have them again in the future. And folks should just be aware of that. And we're here to help if we can. Um, I don't have a lot more off the top of my head. Uh, I mean, I made some notes, but that's, that is my briefing. I shouldn't say off the top of my head makes it sound like I gave it no forethought at all. And I did, um, but I'm happy to answer questions if people have things that are of interest or concern. Hey everybody, you can raise your hand if you have a question for John or uh, an issue you'd like to raise. Oh, Kyle does. Is it a quick comment? I, I believe correction. Wait, um, wait, hang on a sec. Let me get to the microphone. There's no feedback right away. That's good. I know. This is. <laughs> I'm like, so how's the volume for the. Diane, yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, thank you. Just a quick, um, 
that's really good that there's more focus on forest fire and risk prevention. And I'm glad that FireWise program was uh, reminded. And I, I do recall there was major forest, major fires on the island. I mean, it was like maybe like 70 years ago or 80 years ago, but like the whole, whole southwest side of the island was burned out. But there were two major forest, major forest fires on this island. So we have, we have had issues on the past on the island that should have been really serious. I just wanted to emphasize that threat. That's okay. I turn it off here. Yeah, Kyle almost completely vanished there at the end. <laughs> okay. So uh, he wanted to say how how he's grateful for this for this at the very end that he was just grateful that we're the work that's being done here. Okay. Thank you. Well, we have a quorum. And so we can uh, we can approve our, our meeting minutes from the October meeting, and I put them in the chat for people. I also put the agenda in the chat for people, and the draft meeting minutes from October are in in there. So I hope uh, most people have had a chance to take a look at the minutes from the October meeting. And I'm uh, open to any uh, moves to make any corrections if anyone has noticed anything there or any additions that are needed for, to the October meeting minutes. And seeing and hearing none, uh, I will accept them as approved and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Okay. So next, I would like Major Mark Konoski to give us an update from the Sheriff's Department. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, Captain Volpe is on a well-deserved vacation this week and uh, enjoying time with her family. Um, she didn't have any specific pass on for me to cover. So I'm going to share my screen and bring up just a little bit of information if I can. See here. Is sharing your screen an option for you there, Mark? And it says the host disabled. Is that one more okay. time? It says host disabled for sharing. Okay. Well, you should be okay. Keep... Mark, All right. Try it again. See what we can find here. Here we go. All right. All right, so I'll just cover general activity for the last two months. I looked in uh, Captain Volpe's calendar and it, I think it was uh, your last meeting, is that correct, about two months ago? Yes. All right, so uh, typical Vashon, not a huge amount of uh, patterns, which is from our perspective, pretty good. Uh, I just, some common examples of calls that we get on the island, uh, trespassing area checks, vandalism, animal problems, harassment, mental complaints and quarter of violations violations that's just a sampling um we do get a, a variety of calls and, and thank goodness there's very few uh uh crimes of violence and things of that nature uh this is uh just overall calls we had 82 calls meaning people actually calling 911 for us in a two-month period the last two months and this is just sort of a hot spot map where concentrations of calls come from uh, just to give you an idea perspective wise, it's spread all over. Uh, and again, it uh, doesn't look like a pattern. So out of the 82 calls we had in the last two months, um, not every call we go to is a report written. Sometimes it's uh, just to keep the peace or just to answer questions, or maybe it's something that we have no, um, no involvement in as law enforcement, uh, but uh, people call us. So we, we try to help them out. Uh, out of out of the 82 calls, 25 reports written. Uh, that doesn't mean an arrest. It could just be for documentation sake. Uh, but out of, out of all that, there were nine arrests made. And th these are the broad categories that they, they were in. Uh, the assaults were very um, localized in nature, domestic violence primarily. Um, two DUIs, a couple court order violations, one stalking harassment, and one person had a warrant for their arrest. So. In, in the, the world of, of crime, you guys are, from my perspective, looking very good. Um, 
these these uh, dots here represent where all the reports. What I, I haven't figured out in our programming how we had a dot way up here at the the top in the water. So got to figure that one out. I don't know if it's on a boat or what. Um, but we have some new mapping software. Uh, it's uh, it's really becoming beneficial to for us to see if there's any patterns and and what we can address. Uh, the uh, the orange line represents uh, 2021. And these are the months down here at the bottom. Uh, so as you can see, they're sort of paralleling and intertwining. So uh, the general calls for service don't change too much. Uh, there's obviously a drop from October to November and just overall calls for service. So not really, an, not enough difference to really show too much um, um, disparity between last year and this year so far. And that's just a quick update of what's going on on the island when it comes to people calling the sheriff's office. Anyone have any general questions or specific questions in nature? You're my whole reason for coming here tonight. Here you go. Can you see me? In front of this camera. Let me. Um, I'm Lisa Devereaux from Island Funeral Service and Vashon Cemetery. I, in the last two years, have taken. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Nope, this I, microphone. I don't think that that, that microphone is working, but Diane's computer microphone is working very well. So if you just want to walk to the desk, that might actually just be the easiest. Are you saying it is working or not? Uh, Nick is asking if perhaps Lisa can actually speak through your computer or your microphone, perhaps. How about here. this one? I'll just come stand right here. They're both on. Nick was here, suggesting. Here. Have uh, that. I, know. that I don't want it to scream at me. <laughs> if possible. Here, how about that? If I'm interpreting that right, Nick. So here I am. Oh, now perfect. I'm probably really loud. <laughs> um, and I said I'm from Island Funeral Service and the Vashon Cemetery. Over the last two years, I have taken... I don't even know how to count how many endless abusive phone calls from Vashon people who live here, people who don't live here, people who visit their dead at the cemetery about the man who is parked on the cemetery hill. He is parked at the crest of a hill, which is quite dangerous. He's half on cemetery property, half on King County property. King County Police has sent me on a circular route through criminal offices and where I'm told I need a court order, where I'm told I shouldn't have listened to you and not called there. Um, so I'm sort of here to publicly put it on record that we have done everything we can short of cutting the man's brake line and pushing his trailer away from our cemetery so that maybe this will get out and the abuse to me will stop. I wish that you guys would do something to remove him because he is causing damage to the wall that was built by the Daughters of the American Revolution. And he is bothersome to the people who visit the cemetery. And this was the only way I figured I could get on public record to say that I'm doing what I can do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Why don't you come up? We have another person who'd like to comment on the same. Yeah, I've had uh, people tell me that it's a very dangerous situation and uh, difficult to uh, de deal with. So I want to just support Lisa in what she said. If I might as well. Um, and, and this has been brought up uh, many months ago to the community council by another community member as well, I think who has a VLV station, radio station. I can't remember the, the man's name. And uh, I made a report for the waste that was uh, for a waste management report as well. And I do know that some of the garbage was picked up after that, but um, but it was made as a waste management uh, report through the the uh, the road safety as well. So this yeah, this has been brought up for many months as well uh, through different systems. And I, another officer was present here for that one. I think previous to Heather Volpe. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, Mark, if you could comment or share anything, if you even even know about this particular situation. Yeah, I'm aware of uh, at least one person that's uh, 
basically a, a nuisance in a variety of ways. And no excuses. Uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, yeah, uh, I will have someone uh, work on it. And I will uh, make sure that myself or Heather gets back to the group. Uh, we have to size it up, see what we actually have in the way of uh, a problem as it relates to the authority that the sheriff's office has. Uh, I'm not going to um, send you on a uh, chasing your tail kind of thing. We, uh, we have this on the mainland all the time. Uh, and uh, there's a variety of factors in play. Uh, I don't know, is this person homeless? Uh, pardon me, probably not the correct term. Um, there's there's so many mitigating factors, uh, but I understand if uh, they're a hazard, if they're harassing people, uh, if they're leaving waste, those are all things that we can address uh, depending on where they're parked. Uh, so I can have someone uh, directly address this issue. And uh, if we can do things about it to solve it, we will. If we can't, we'll let you know that as well. So Mark, do you think that uh, uh, one of the a uh, representative from the sheriff's department could come to our December meeting and report back on this. Uh, it's, it's We've possible. been having a sheriff's, sheriff's office come every other month, but I'm not sure we want to wait that long for a report back. Okay, um, likely, yeah. Um, uh, when's the date for it? Uh, it depends. It's uh, we'll ha I'll have to let you know because we're taking a vote tonight to possibly change our meetings to Thursday nights. So if that vote passes, it will be December I can't remember which date it's going to be, but I'll let you know for sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Bika. Hi, um, I had a question. I live on 180th, actually right across from the funeral home um, by the Methodist Church down that private lane. Um, there is a stretch of Vashon Highway from about Eagles to town that is 25 miles per hour, but nobody respects it until it feels like they're really in town. And um, it there there's a couple of concerns I have. One, it becomes very challenging to pull out of our driveway out of 180th, often with traffic coming in either direction, particularly um, you know, during busy times and ferries. Um, but two, I have been a de facto death doula for deer um, twice now. And that just happened to be deer that were hit at 180th and made their way down our lane about 20 yards um, in, in the last uh, year and a half. Um, but I know that there have been others, not just exactly where we are, but a, a tiny bit south. So this is a main thoroughfare for the deer, and they live on properties both to the east and west on Vashon Highway. And, um, you know, this deer had a baby that hovered all day while while it's and and we called um, to get the deer dispatched and and that never happened. Um, so anyhow, there used to be, uh, um, for a very brief, like two day, maybe three day period, uh, one of those, like, this is how fast you're going lights flashing um, at by eagles on, on a, and, and then it was gone. And I don't know if that's because somebody ripped it down, but it was awesome because people slowed down. Um, so I'm wondering if that can get put back up and even potentially in both directions. Okay. Taking some notes here. All right, thank you. And I'm gonna read um, a chat that was put in for the folks on the phone. Um, this is Deborah Gusson and she says, thank you for your service. Our neighborhood has raised multiple concerns regarding accidents on the north end of the highway near the John L. Scott building. So that's the intersection of Cedarhurst Road and Vashon Highway Southwest. The seventh accident in less than two years on this dangerous stretch happened on Saturday, but we have not been able to get any response in terms of citations to try to prevent further accidents slash injuries. What should we do? Okay, so uh, when it comes to traffic issues and traffic enforcement, 
Um, I don't know if this has been shared with the group in, with previous uh, sheriff's office members. You have three things. Um, education is always first, uh, followed by engineering of the roadway, followed by enforcement. So the one component that we can be involved in is enforcement. So this is a very specific location. Um, I can generate what we call internally a traffic complaint and have officers work that. Um, so that's the one component. If there's something else in design, um, we need to get uh, roads or maybe local services could help us get, uh, get to who could take a look at it and see if there's any kind of uh, uh, traffic calming measures that can uh, be employed. So uh, that's what I can do. Uh, one of the things I would like, I, I see it's the north end near John L. Scott, that's a pretty specific location. Um, I want to back up, Ms. Uh, uh, is it Becca? I didn't get your last name. Economopolis. Okay, thank you. Um, was there a time of day near your house that the majority of the, the traffic was an issue? Because we have to narrow our focus so I can have people assigned there to try to get it when it's at its worst. Um, yeah, it's really ferries. Um, and, okay. Yeah, the ferry schedule. And there are times when ferries release um, on both ends such that um, they're, they're really busy um, where we are, both sides of the highway. Yeah. And then as far as the deer getting hit, I mean, this deer was hit uh, a week ago um, and another a year ago. Um, and then I was walking back in the morning um, from town to my house uh, a few days ago. And I watched a deer that was in the middle of the road and I saw a car coming and I'm like, okay, there's like, there's no way the car doesn't see this deer <laughs> slow down and it'll, it'll finish crossing the road. And it wasn't until the last minute that the car slammed on their brakes. So they're just going too fast. And I don't want to keep dealing with, with hit deer by my house. Becca, I have a question for you. Uh, Lisa was wondering if uh, it's also very busy when school is out, school gets out. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. With the school bus um, dropping off right there at 180th and Methodist and, and Vashon Highway right by the church. It, that actually, thank you for raising that because I'll say there's just one other consideration, which is that there's a lot of kids that live around here um, and including folks from Ernesty, the, the housing development there that have a ton of kids. And so their kids go to the bus stop at 180th and Vashon Highway. And also they walk to town because we're a block away. Um, so we do have a safety concern there. Okay, thank you. And thank you. back to Deborah, uh, particular time of day that you're seeing this? It's pretty much all day, every day when the ferries come and go. And it's a, it's just a terrible, I mean, it's a, it's a double curve right between two stretches, no lighting, a deer thoroughfare and people are heading to the ferry. And the, the, I don't know why the speed limit is 50. We've talked to Wally multiple times and he sends us to the sheriff. And then, so it feels like, you know, our neighborhood has, has reached out a, numbers of times and we keep sort of getting punted back and forth. So trying to look for either, is there signage? Is there reduced speed? Can we patrol it? And there doesn't really seem to be any, and you know, somebody's probably gonna die. I mean, that we've just had terrible accidents constantly. So, okay. yeah. So I, I don't know, like we're, we're just trying to look at what, what should we do? What should we do next? What would be the next step that we should take? Well, I can't advise on the next step. I can just advise what I'm gonna do about it. Um, so, you know that we regularly have deputies on the island. There is uh, a fair amount of unaccounted for time, meaning time available of those deputies. So, as the, the precinct commander, I can assign uh, some problem solving projects to start looking at this, not only for the short term, because uh, that's literally what traffic enforcement is in specific areas like this. You can do it, you can hit it hard for a month, two months, three months. Then, when you let up, it very easily is seen, and then it reverts back. That's just human nature. It's what I've seen over 30 some years of, of doing this. So we can do that, but I would rather uh, start looking at longer term 
um, you know, solving the problem longer term. Uh, again, uh, I can try to network. Uh, I only have authority over my people and what we do within the realm of law enforcement. So uh, that's what I'll do. Okay. Okay. We have Robert Gibbs here. On, oh, I'm sorry, Deborah. Did you want to say any, anything more there? No, I just said thanks. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Robert uh, has a. Let's put that one on. Okay. Yeah. Is there another button? For well, it's on. Can you try one more time? It's on. That's true. It says it's on. Nicholas, can you hear? Testing, testing, Ms. Jesus. Testing. Can we get a confirmation? Yeah, they can hear you. Testing. Yeah, so back on the the guy that's camping up by the cemetery, he's been there for two years, and there have been numerous calls from the community about the hazards and the harassment and problems that he's creating there where he's camping. And I wonder, I'd be curious if we can get all of the police reports or incident reports that have been prepared every time someone calls to report this problem. Could we get those off so we could look at those for the next meeting? Uh, yes, uh, there is a public disclosure link right on our webpage where uh, you can request a wide variety of information. Washington State's one of the most uh, uh, liberal states when it comes to public disclosures. We, we give, unless there's an active investigation where we have to redact some things going on, outside of that, we, we give up any information you want. Great, and will you make sure that we have that? If we send in a, re a request tomorrow, will you make sure that we have the response before the next meeting next month in December? Uh, I can't guarantee that. I, what I can guarantee is that I can connect you with the public disclosure unit with uh, the sheriff's office and they're the ones that hold all of this information. Um, and the, the request has to be very specific in nature, time frames, and location. Well, I don't know that we remember, we can give you the address where the location is and you can look over the last two years and see what uh, incidents were reported at that address. Will that be sufficient? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and, and can we tell the public disclosure person that you told us you would make sure that we got this these documents on time? So, hold on here. Um, I don't have authority over the uh, public disclosure unit. I can call them and say, hey, this is a request by our uh, community council on Vashon, so please uh, get it to them. They have time frames; they have to get the information to you and the whole nine yards. Uh, if not, then uh, uh, there's some repercussions for the public disclosure unit but you'll encourage them to respond within the scope of the time that's set forth in the RCW? Yes, 100%. All right, thank you. Deborah had a question. She wants to know if it's, if it's something that the secretary of the community council, corresponding secretary can, can submit as a request. Yeah, certainly. Certainly could. Anybody could. Yeah, it's an online form. Any person can make that. So we'll collaborate to make sure that it's. Okay. So Hunter, as the uh, as the corresponding secretary. Yes. Uh, would you be Would you be willing to uh, uh, work with Robert on this and submit yes. that on yes. letterhead? Yes. Or. Uh, or I'm, or I'm willing to let out on, as a representative of the community council. Yeah, and and I I think I have Robert's um, email. I know Robert, so we can get together. And well, if you don't, that. I'll give it to you. I think I have. Okay, well, he has mine. Wonderful. Now we'll get that get that going then. Okay, and um, so I think uh, uh, Mark and Morgan has his hand up with a question. Uh, thanks, Diane. Um, uh, question a little bit for, for the major, but also a little bit for John Taylor, if he's there since he's got roads underneath him. But I wanted to, to follow up on Becca's comments and reinforce that a little bit, that uh, 
there's clearly an issue, you know, in that zone where you're going from 40 miles an hour down to 25 miles per hour. But I think I want to put it also in the context that I think part of that problem is that 40 mile per hour zone between town and center. It is, you know, it's, it's our town. That's all our town. And it includes a stretch of about a miles per hour and it's 40 miles per hour there. And therefore people drive about 50 on it. And that is a pretty dangerous and scary stretch. It's where a lot of school kids walk on it. A lot of it's dark and not well lit at night with the whole thing about phones and everything. It's, it's, it's kind of terrifying on that. I actually would like to put in not just, you know, the enforcing of the 40, but I think that stretch should have its speed. I'm not the first to say this, but I want to reinforce it. That stretch between center and town um, should have its speed limit lowered if we want to put a little bit more emphasis on, on the fact that that's a walkable zone. It's used in that way a lot in a fairly dangerous way. There's a huge difference between 40 mile per hour speed limits, let alone what people do above it and down to 30 or what would be more appropriate for that, given that it's a town becoming more and more walkable and more and more people living there. So I think this is tied in with Becca's comment. If you're going in a 40 mile per hour zone where a lot of people are going 50 and then suddenly you're slowing down to 25, that's a big problem. If that whole thing were 30 miles per hour or 25 or whatever, I know it would be a big burden for a lot of people that are trying to get to ferries from one side or the other. But if the priority is on walkable and on safety and a town that is actually designed more for people than for cars and throughput, that'd be a good thing. Thank you, Morgan. Okay, anyone else? Or can we move on now? And uh, what does it take to reduce the speed limit, Mark? on a stretch of highway on the on Vashon? Uh, that I'd have to defer to a local services. We, yeah. we don't, don't have kind of that isn't a question for Mark. Um, I mean, typically what we'll do is we'll do a speed study. We'll look at accident records. And, uh, you know, it sounds like um, Wally, who is our traffic guy, has been out and looked at the stretch before. I'm happy to have him come out and take a look at it again. The, the thing I would say to folks, and it's counterintuitive, but um, lowering speed limits doesn't necessarily always lower speed. Uh, in fact, if you lower speed limits too much, uh, people just completely ignore the signs. So uh, there's, a, there's a whole science to how road services goes about posting side roads for speed limits. I'm not a traffic engineer. I'm not going to pretend to be. Uh, what I would say is if this is a stretch that people have concerns about, and clearly people do, and the deer population clearly has concerns, and if they had agency, they would alert us to this. So I'm happy to have Rhodes take a look at it um, and see if there's anything we can do, but I don't want to lead people down a primrose path where, you know, signs, signs in and of themselves are not, uh, they, they don't solve traffic problems. Uh, flashing slow down signs. Someone just put that in there. Sometimes those work. Sometimes they, uh, the pedestrian flashing signs, we only put in in very specific places. Uh, we have limited experience putting in sort of the automated speed reading signs that warn people. And the one thing about those signs, and I think people will note this if you drive around a lot, they're calibrated to stop at about 40 miles an hour because they are oftentimes used by kids who want to see how fast they can go to calibrate their speedometer. So, you know, they, they are, again, they're, they're tools, but this isn't, there's no one arrow that's going to bring down this bison. It's a, it's a multifaceted approach to solving a problem. Anyway, let me, I, I've listened to the conversation. Uh, we'll follow up. We'll have someone from Rhodes take a look at it again. And I'm sure that uh, the sheriff's office is going to, you know, do their thing. And maybe, maybe between us, we can break a pick on this rock. Thank you very much for that, John. I really appreciate that. And uh, um, so you're going to have Rhodes take a look at that, at that stretch again. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on now. 
And now, uh, John Vizina, would you uh, like to share what you have to share tonight? Hey, Diane, thank you. Um, so I'm the Director of Planning, Customer and Government Relations for WSF. Um, I know given our current service levels, there's probably lots of questions or thoughts about, um, about how things are going. Um, without derailing the agenda, when I'm done, if there's a couple of questions I can answer, I'm happy to, um, or I can come back next month. But I'm actually here tonight on, with a different hat on. I also lead WSF's Diversity Advisory Group. And one of the things that we're doing is we work to become an anti-racist organization, definitely diversify our hiring and, and do better um, as you know, maritime industry has been traditionally straight white men, and we're trying to reach out to different communities, definitely to women, LGBT folks, and BIPOC communities to improve our hiring. But as we talk with tribal members, we found that there's real concern about um, the, the terminals we have, our 20 terminals, and where they're located, obviously on the traditional tribal lands around Puget Sound. Um, and one of the things that was raised was the naming of the um, Telequa terminal. And apparently the name came from a newspaper contest on island and a white woman um, submitted the name. It's actually, actually a Cherokee name. It's a place in Oklahoma. Um, and the, um, our tribal representative and the diversity advisory group is interested in working in the, um, Puyall with the Puyallup tribe and perhaps renaming the terminal to reflect the tribal significance of the site rather than this random name from Oklahoma. Um, we actually don't do the naming. That would be done by the State Transportation Commission. Um, we, you know, if there was support for this, and you're our very first stop because we don't, you know, this is your community and you may feel an affinity to the name, um, or there may be other concerns, or there may be support for or you know for working with you um, with the Puyallup tribe. On a, on a new name that would more accurately reflect the history there. You know, for, there were tribal folks and Native Americans in the area for 16,000 years before white people came. And um, we do know that there were Puyallup um, settlements near, uh, you know, on Vashon and near Tahlequah. So I just wanted to, um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. I don't, you know, I'm interested if there's some initial feedback with again, without taking over um, your agenda. Um, if there is support or if there's strong feelings against it, you know, it would probably be helpful to have the council weigh in with something official and let us know um, what your thoughts are. Um, but, you know, we are, for example, at the new Coleman Dock in Seattle, um, which is traditionally Duwamish land, we are working with tribes um, with the Snohomish and the um, Duwamish to name two plazas there and give them um, tribal names, Native American names, rather than just Coleman Dock, um, as we work to, you know, acknowledge that the land most of us reside on um, was previously tribal land. So, Diane, with that, I will um, take your direction. If you know, I'm happy to just finish with that and put my email in the um, in the chat, um, or to take any initial comments, and then you know, work with you moving forward if the council wants to take an official position. Well, I don't know about an official position, but you know what? There's nothing stopping us from taking a straw vote right now uh, with the people who are here. If uh, I'd like a show of hands of uh, the folks who are at this meeting, if uh, the members who are at this meeting, if you'd like us to go ahead and take a straw vote on this issue, just to get some initial feedback. The question is, are we, okay? is it okay to take a straw vote, first of all? Just, just a straw vote. Because not everyone, you know, wants to do that. So it definitely, we're going to do that. So, so the question is that we'd like you can raise your. Well, put first, put every, put your hands down first, everybody. <laughs> and then the question is, should we consider changing the name of Tahlequah and working with the Puyallup tribe on a more relevant name? Hands up. If you agree with that, just as a the South End Ferry, Tahlequah. The meaning of Tahlequah is two is a job by leading between two. Okay, well, uh, all we have one, two, three, four, five, six folks here, and looks like 
quite a few over there. Three, six. It uh, looks like on, there's oh, 21 now on, on the 21, and we have 40, uh, but it's uh, it's anybody on a straw vote, anybody can vote. So, all right. So, John, does that help? Yeah, is there, a, do you have a final tally just that? Hey, okay, so uh, uh, folks here in the 29. Out of 38 participants uh, plus six, so uh, to 20, 29 out of uh, 44. So then do you want to, um, I just, if the other 15, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but I wonder if the other 15 are against it or if they just chose not to vote. But it seems, you know, that seems fairly indicative that it's at least worth talking about. Yeah, I would say so. I think it's fairly indicative. It's it's worth talking about. And the next steps would be to see if uh, there would be, this would be something that the uh, the equity committee would like to look into. The equity, social justice and inclusion committee, it sounds like it's kind of right down their alley, but we'll ask, we'll have them when it's, they come to talk, this is something that they could take a look at and, and see if they want to address this as part of their committee work. Okay, so I, I will go back to the diversity advisory group and our tribal liaison and say, um, you know, that there's some preliminary interest and in that the council to equity group may look at it um, and that we can talk to the Puyallups and get some ideas that we would bring back to you. Again, this is a long way from getting done. It's just an initial thought. Um, and we would, you know, obviously bring names back to you and get your input. Um, and this would have to go to the State Transportation Commission, as I said. So there would be public hearings. Um, there would be a vote by the commission on doing this. So um, no one's getting railroaded and no one's getting, um, you know, none of this is for certain. Um, just something we'd like to explore. That sounds right. So, uh, Kevin, you had your hand up, and I was wondering where you went. So, uh, Kevin John Jones. just answered the question that I had in mind. He oh, okay, articulated Kevin. what his next steps were, and that he very much has ownership of this issue. John, is my understanding, you're going to continue working along these lines. Yeah. So, appreciate that understanding of who has. Um, uh, who has the ball, if you will? Thank you. I've got the ball, but I'm at some point we'll be handing it off to you all. At least um, I can't think of a painful continuation of the sports metaphor, but um, I'll be passing <laughs> it um, so you can pass back as an assist before the layup. How about that? <laughs> okay. That's um, right. Oh, great. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll um, move on next. Do we have the Yes, do you have a question? Oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand up. I'm sorry. Come on, grab the mic. Uh, we have a um, resolution to consider here later in the meeting about uh, the ferry service and trying to figure out ways to deal with the uh, poor ferry service that we've been having for the last couple of years. And so I have some questions about that. The first one is, we're currently on a what's called an alternate schedule that we've been on endlessly since sometime in the COVID days. And the regular emails we get every other day, it seems like telling us that we're on that alternate schedule. If you read it closely, you see that there's only uh, two or three routes in the whole system that are on an alternate schedule, Fashion being one of them. All the other routes are on their regular schedule. Can you tell us when you anticipate that Vashon will be back to its regular approved schedule? Sure, so just a little bit of background so that everyone's on the same page. Um, last summer, we, you know, as you all know, as well as I do, and perhaps better, um, as COVID was still going um, before there was a vaccine mandate or anything, we were having real trouble crewing our vessels with um, with people who retired. You know, I, in the nearly seven years I've been in this job, we've been telling the legislature that we had a silver tsunami coming, and that 55 to 65 percent of our senior um, deck folks, especially, but engine room and deck, um, were eligible to retire. 
And during COVID, a lot of them did that. Um, and so we heard from customers over and over, we, we need reliable service. Even if it's less service, we need reliable service. So a year ago, last month in October, 2021, we put out a service, um, a, an alternative schedule that we knew we had the crewing, that we could at least keep those minimum levels. And as you know, that was two boats on the triangle. And then after you know the vaccines and things started getting better last year, in March, we put out a service restoration plan um, that really, and I can put a link in the chat, um, it really explains what the challenges are and the prioritization to build back. Um, we also committed to doing a bi-weekly progress report. I'll also drop that in um, so that people could, you know, to hold us accountable and to see where we were. So there were eight, eight routes downsized. Currently, three of those eight have been restored. So we've restored um, San Juan Islands, um, and the restoration is based on ridership uh, options, other, you know, other travel options. Um, and vessel compatibility because we need to have vessels that can work on the route. So with the Sam ones that are wholly reliant on us, just as you are, um, we restored first. And then based on their ridership, um, we restored Seattle Bainbridge and then Clinton Muckleteo. So those are the three that are restored. Um, they, they do not have reliable service all the time, especially in the San Juans. We have real significant challenges and we have to tie up boats because we don't have crew members still to get in, to get up there if we have a relief request. Edmonds Kingston is being restored sort of on a daily basis. We let them know if they'll have one boat or two. Like today, they didn't have it in the morning, they had it in the afternoon. And then the triangle is next. And, you know, Bremerton has been on one boat service um, since before you all were on too, since the day after Labor Day last year. And we had said that we are going to um, look at when we have the crewing and the boats available, we would look after Edmonds Kingston is restored on who we did next, the Triangle or Seattle Bremerton. Um, we, as we look at long-term fixes, which I can go into if you want, but short-term, we are decrewing um, a route. In, in Bremerton, we are decrewing a second vessel there because we need licensed deck officers. That's our constraint. So January 1st, we will decrew their second boat of licensed deck officers. That will let us um, trial restoration on Edmonds Kingston. And then I hope by early February, because of the licensed deck officers we'll, we'll get from that reorganization, we'll have both the vessel availability and the crewing availability to trial a third boat uh, on the triangle route. Um, after, you know, if we're successful with that, we'll go to Seattle Bremerton, Port Townsend Coopville, and then the Sydney route. Um, also, this licensed deck officer problem we have, um, we will, um, we have hopefully almost 20 people going into the um, a training class um, to become mates. That, you know, again, that's our uh, biggest constraint, those licensed deck officers. They'll go into class in January and they will graduate in April. So we're very hopeful at this point that we're going to be able to, um, to have your third boat long before then, but that's what will give us the, um, the crewing we need to restore service beyond you. Um, and, and I will say, we've, the legislature this year really stepped up. Um, as I said, for the seven years I've been in this job, we have told them we have this problem coming. But you know, before 1999 and I-695, Tim Iman's initiative, we got dedicated funding from, the, um, from car tabs. That went away. No new boats were built for 10 years between 2000 and 2010. Fares went up, routes were, were um, sailings were cut back. And you know, we just didn't have the capacity to train the people that we needed to, to run the service. So now that we're in crisis, the legislature has seen that. They gave us more money this year. We've developed two new programs to help get us those licensed deck officers. But we think in the next five years, we're going to need 105 new licensed deck officers. Um, they require a great deal, 555 days of sea time to get their pilotage for Puget Sound. Um, and there's no way to rush that. So sorry, that's a long way of saying I'm hoping that um, we'll be able to trial three boat service. 
at the beginning of February. That is dependent on the crewing and vessel availability we need. Um, but after Edmonds Kingston, you are next on the list with three other routes behind you. John, thank you very much for that incredibly detailed uh, update on where everything is. I have another question here. Justin Hirsch has a question. Hi, John. I can't uh, see on the screen, but I'm doing the uh, in-person bit here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hello, nice to see you. Hybrid meetings are always challenging. Um, so I have a, a question on the Fauntleroy dock and then I have a question for the council about procedure for tonight because I'm not just as far as ferry stuff, I'm not gonna have more to report than what John can tell us here. So um, the question on Fauntleroy of course is, you know, is there a scheduled meeting of the community advisory group uh, where's that at and, and what's the timeline looking like? Thanks for that. And I should know the answer, but I will get it to you. And you know, before I start, thanks to Justin and Rachel Rome, who are the two um, of the three Vashon Island um, Ferry Advisory Committee members who do a really good job in telling my colleagues and me about the challenges you all face. And, um, you know, especially right now, how challenging it is. And I really appreciate the work Justin's done to to understand our service and to represent you all to us. Um, you know, I, I really want to make a pitch. The Fauntleroy project, um, I remember standing at a public meeting in probably 2018 on Vashon and having probably 25 people around me who were super frustrated slash angry about the schedule rewrite and had really um, good, strong opinions about things that should change. And I remember talking about, you know, the route serves three communities and um, some of the ideas that, that were coming from Vashon about changing procedure in Fauntleroy. Um, at the same time, Fauntleroy was telling us things that were not helpful, obviously, to, to Islanders. And I made a, pl a plea to please reach out and start working with people in Fauntleroy to understand what it's like for you to be late home for childcare or, you know, not to be able to get to work or the chemotherapy appointments. And, you know, while that I think was a big ask, we now have a task force, a community advisory group that's looking at, um, at, at the Fauntleroy dock. And, you know, I'm really pleased that Justin and others of you have gotten involved in that process because Fauntleroy is heavily invested. You know, they obviously don't want any further, um, you know, a bigger dock, a longer dock, um, more capacity there, um, and the community advisory group. And while I'm talking, I'm looking this up so I can um, try to find it. Um, you know, I hope you will all um, really get involved with this process. I'm going to put a link in the chat right now um, because Southworth, Southworth, and Bashan. Um, are two thirds of that. You all are wholly reliant. I know you've got Point Defiance Telequa, but um, you know you need that North End to um, to really work. And so um, you know that we we're trying to balance all three communities and the needs. Um, but right now we're we have a, a community advisory group that Justin was talking about um, that is working. And my understanding is from the people involved, it's working well. I mean, people are talking to each other and Vashon especially is being represented and explaining their position. Um, and then we have a technical advisory group who are more like the Coast Guard and, and community transit and planners who do this all the time, who are looking at, um, at, you know, at the project. So, um, you know, Justin, I apologize that I don't know the next date of the, um, let me see if it's on the community. Um, it's okay. I, I did look at the the Fauntleroy Project website and I didn't see a date. So I was wondering if there was something that was uh, I will, uh, scheduled um, or planned. I will text a colleague and drop it in the chat if I can get a quick response. Great. Thanks, Justin. Oh, uh -huh. One more thing. Sorry, one more item. Um, 
John, just something I've experienced, a number of other riders have experienced, the 7.15 a.m. Vashon uh, Fauntleroy sailing really may as well be a 7.20 because every single morning it's out there hovering for uh, maybe five to seven minutes waiting for the vessel in front of it, the 7 a.m. departure to leave. May, for as long as we're stuck with this current schedule, and boy, I, I hope you're right about that February date. Um, that little technical correction that 715 could be become 720, probably squeeze a few more cars on the boat and then not have to wait in the water for the next boat to clear the fall terminal. Okay, I will talk to planners about that. You know, one of the real problems we're having, and when I ask about this, when I hear from you, from, from you, Justin, or from others there, um, we are funded by the legislature, you know, um, thanks in large part to Senator Wynn Rep and Representative Fitzgibbon and Cody um, for traffic control at Fauntleroy. It's um, until this year, it was the only place that we were actually funded for traffic control. And um, our problem is that a couple of years ago, WSP told us they were not gonna do traffic control for, for us anymore. And then just before COVID, Seattle Police Department told us they were not going to participate in giving us off-duty officers. So we had to go and contract with a private security firm, um, firm called um, Puget Sound Executive Services for traffic control. And that was working well until COVID because they tend to use off-duty WSP and Seattle police officers who they hire. But those people now, there's such a workforce shortage at WSP and Seattle PD that the people are getting so more than enough overtime at their jobs so they're not bidding on our traffic control work. And, you know, I think the vessels are, well, I know from my colleagues at the terminals and on the vessels, they're getting behind because the offload takes so long without a police officer there to direct people and, you know, hold traffic so that we can empty the boat and then re and reload it. So it's something we're working on hard trying to get that done. Um, but in the meantime, Justin, thanks for that. And I'll talk to planners and see if, if there, if it's, if it's just factually a 720 anyway, why wouldn't we, you know, hold five minutes at Vashon before it goes? Okay, <clears throat> we're going to have to make it quick. Ben Carr has a question. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, just a quick question for John. Do they, they don't, they don't have to be commissioned officers, though, to direct traffic, right? I mean, is there a reason that we don't contract with somebody who doesn't, you know, use off-duty time and a half overtime police officers? Um, they, ha I don't think they have to be uniform, but they have to be trained. And when we looked at people we could contract with, Puget Sound Executive Services is the only group we found who had people with the requisite training who we could put out in traffic. Like our employees don't have that. Okay, does that answer the question, Ben? Okay. Sorry, Diane, to take over more time, but hopefully if, when you add it to Justin's time later, hopefully it doesn't put you off schedule too much. No, it's okay. And uh, this is going to be a great recording uh, for people to take a look at if they want to know what is going on with the ferries. And, um, we do not have a community advisory group meeting scheduled right now, um, the next one scheduled. So we will publicize that and let you all know when we do. Okay, so Justin, did you hear that? Okay, he heard that. Very good. Okay, thank well, you we're all. gonna thank you very much, John. Really appreciate it. We'll have you come back another time. Always ready. Okay, so now we're on to committee and board updates. And uh, first will be the Affordable Housing Committee update. And uh, David has uh, an update for us. David, are you ready to share that with us? Uh, actually, I um, I am ready, but uh, the chair is here. Yeah, oh, I, I got oh, back are? early, Diane. I, I, I mentioned I didn't think I was going to make it to this, but we drove fast back from Portland. So. Oh, my goodness. So I hope you didn't hurt anybody. Yeah, no, no, no. Speed limit, whole way. Okay, um, you're, you're, you're on. Okay. Anyway, uh, we had um, we've had a couple of real good uh, affordable housing committee meetings. The the last two, the one before the last one, as we discussed, was on the sub area plan, and I'll circle back to that. But the last one, um, we took a little bit of a hiatus from that, even though the sub area plan is pretty timely right now. But because uh, we had an opportunity to talk with uh, Chris Brick, who heads up a group called um, um, Shelter America Group, 
um, which is kind of similar to Vashon Household, but does most of their work in the states of Washington and Oregon and not on Vashon. But they have a project called Creekside Village, uh, which is on Gorsuch Road, which is after a long, windy, twisty route, is um, looking to where they have all of their financing lined up from a convoluted group that includes the county and the state and sort of others to do a 40 unit affordable housing uh, project on Gorsuch Road, a, a walk to town, north of town. And so we had him give an update on that. Some of you may have been following this one over the years. It's been written up in the Beachcomber and stuff a few times, but that was, that was very good. I think the main thing I'd sort of say on it is it does have sort of the financing all lined up right now that's been sort of tough. Um, and uh, they anticipate going through permitting right now in the next six to eight months and then a little over a year construction and they are expecting to be able now to be able to get people into housing there in uh, the end of, of uh, 2024 so essentially two years from now it shows from beginning to end how long and how difficult it can be to do some of these public um, affordable housing projects but anyway 40 new units uh, when we have about 76 now with Vashon household it's a significant improvement and that and the center townhomes which is going to be another 40 those are some pretty significant increases to rental uh, affordable housing on the island. So that was pretty exciting. A uh, lot more details on it. And, uh, you know, there's there's a way I'll, I'll try to get a link up on the uh, Vashon Community uh, Council site so that people can go and look at the recording and see the chats and stuff on that. The next thing I, I wanted to bring out is um, we are going to circle back to the sub area plan. This is a timely thing. I think um, we get the opportunity with the council to discuss and debate this, and then we'll bring it to the council. And I think we should try to have pretty strong opinions on this because this is um, an opportunity with the next comprehensive plan review uh, to influence some, some zoning potential changes. Uh, and they, they are addressed looking at them anyway, so they're gonna make a, an opinion on it uh, with or without you know, opinion from the community here. And there's two critical ones. I've said it before, but I'll mention them briefly again. Uh, both of them affect density of the town. One of the few places we have where we can actually put multifamily housing on the island um, and increase the housing supply. And one of them has to do with one of the hottest topics we had in the last uh, sub area plan in 2016, 2017, which is the special district overlay where you could bump up to 18 units per acre if you're doing 100% affordable housing project. Well, no developers have been willing to do that. So they're either going to scrap it or they're gonna to try to modify it. And on our committee, we've been through a bunch of pros and cons on it. We're gonna to continue to debate that and we'll bring it to the council later. But if you know of this and you have an opinion on it, please, please attend our, our next affordable housing conference. The other one has to do with height in town. Normally, um, the zoning would allow for five floors there and a fairly dense um, thing, but the town plan that was put in place in 96, 97 and actually kind of codified in the 2016, 2017 uh, sub area plan basically put in a two floor or 35 feet height restriction, which is more, more or less two floors. That was a, a vast downsizing of town. So there's people who are for that. There's people who are against it. We want in our next committee, after we've gone over pros and cons of it, to debate it. We'd love to hear from people who are on both sides of that at our next meeting, which will be December 12th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And I'll post right now my email and that information. Anybody wants a link to it can contact me. And then maybe we'll even get that one up on the um, community council site by before in time for people to attend it. So, oh, oh one other thing, there's a little bit more detail. If you pick up your beachcomber, Amy Dreyer did a very good story on this issue in the last, pretty prominently on page four in the beachcomber where she goes over the issues in a, in a good article. So you can also take a look at that. And I pasted the, a link to that um, in the chat. So that's it sort of for my report, unless anybody's got any questions. Not seeing anybody's hands up, so that's great. Thank you very much for that update. I'm glad you made it back, and uh, lots happening. I'm very happy to see new units come on board. Not soon enough, but they're coming. Yep. Okay, Equity, Social Justice, and Inclusion Committee. Kevin, would you like to give us an update? I will. Thank you, Diane. 
uh, the committee is uh, spending a uh, focusing on what exactly our mission and goals objectives are for our outreach to the community. Uh, we've had some very good discussions about that. And the key thing is to make sure that we're all uh, have a common awareness and common understanding of what we're trying to achieve and how we're going about going about doing it. And so the latest statement uh, that came uh, up in discussion at the committee is to conduct meaningful conversations with our community to be aware of barriers that community members face and embrace diversity as a positive goal. Based on this insight, make recommendations so the council may become a most effective change agent to improve the flourishing and resilience of community members. So if you uh, have an opportunity to think about that and wanna contribute your thoughts uh, to the committee, um, definitely join us at our meetings. Those are at 6 p.m. the first and third Wednesdays. I will go ahead and put my email in the chat in case anybody wants to contact me directly. Uh, that statement is uh, that I read was in development. So just to give a snapshot of what our, what our current thoughts are and we welcome everybody's view of um, you know, how, to, how to guide our thinking about that. And uh, the last thing I'll say is the land acknowledgement motion of course is coming up later in the agenda. So um, we'll hold comment there, but uh, we'll certainly have a number of committee members here, I think will be interested in helping to uh, provide their rationale for the value of a land acknowledgement statement. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. You're welcome, Dan. Okay, the next item on the agenda is about board members. We're having a, a new board starting December 1st, but what I would like to do first is thank the existing board members who are leaving the board very much for their service these last two years. It's been difficult to run these meetings and not see each other, and it's difficult to develop relationships when you're not in each other's presence and it's just on Zoom. And hopefully we'll be able to continue now with these uh, hybrid meetings and develop stronger relationships on the board. So thank you, David Vogel, who uh, for your service and who may be back on the board soon, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Hunter Davis, thank you so much. Kyle Britz, thanks. Uh, Michaela Olivari, is, uh, uh, thank you so much for her service. Nick Simmons, I don't know what we're going to do running these meetings without you, Nick. Maybe we'll have to bend your arm to come on back. And Rachel Rome. Our new board members are going to are here this evening and will introduce themselves. And we're going to start, if we would please, with Ben Carr. Ben, would you say a, a couple words about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm not sure if there's any prompts. Uh, my name uh, is Ben Carr. Uh, I, my family and I live uh, on here on the island over near Sawbones. Um, uh, I used to be a prosecutor with King County uh, for a number of years, and uh, now I work for the Attorney General's office. Uh, that's my day job. Uh, I joined the um, the council because I wanted to get more involved here in the community. Uh, I have particular interest in seeing some kind of bike path or pedestrian path. I hope we can make that happen in the foreseeable future. That's what I'm going to push for. Um, uh, but if anyone else wants to chat further, um, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Our next new board member is Debbie Jackson. You want to come over here, Debbie, and share my mic? Hi, uh, my name is Debbie Jackson. I was born in Tacoma. I grew up in Seattle. I went to Roosevelt High School in the UW. I'm sort of like the local person who's uh, rare these days, I guess. Um, I've lived on Vashon almost 45 years and raised two kids here. Um, my interests on Vashon are, well, one, I'm in the rowing club uh, for about 32 years, uh, Vashon Island Rowing Club. I have, uh, do some running and, uh, uh, what else? Oh, I've, uh, been on the leadership team for Indivisible Vashon and done a lot of, uh, postcarding, kind of organizing postcarding for the last couple of years. So that's uh, gotten me more involved in, um, I guess, the bigger world, but uh, looking locally. 
my interest in joining the uh, community council one Diane called me so uh <laughs> so I really respect Diane and uh kind of like working with her uh on a different uh, uh I guess another interest is that you know the old uh, think global act local uh, I felt like well it might be a good thing to uh to become involved in the community council and try to interface between uh the powers that be off the island and the local folks and uh i'm a pretty good listener so um that's my main thing oh i forgot to say uh, uh i am retired but i was a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator and commuted to tacoma to multi-care for a bunch of years so that's my professional background so i have interest in health and in recreation i guess thanks thank you okay i'm next on the list and uh I've been involved since the very first meeting when David Vogel came back to Vashon and said, what, there's no community council here? And pulled together a group of people. And I don't think we would have this organization even now if David hadn't done that. Because I was waiting for someone to do that because uh, I, I wanted to see a community council here. I have only been on the island since 2013 and there wasn't one when I arrived. So. Um, it's really important to me, and I um, am committed to keeping this thing going. I have run three businesses. I'm not retired, and uh, so it's uh, I, I'm unable to put in as much time on this as I would like, but uh, it's happening. And I have uh, a lot of business background, and uh, I'm a landscaper on the island specializing in pruning, and uh, my husband and I work to reduce the use of toxic pesticides on the island through Garden Green. And we run a nursery as well. So that's keeping me very busy. So that's me. Next, we have Dustin Coe. Dustin. Hey, can everybody hear me OK? Yes. All right, I got a heads up. Thanks, man. <laughs> um, so I've lived on Vashon for about five years. I come from a very small town uh, growing up, so I understand community quite well. And this is kind of my forever home that I moved to. I did live on Woodby Island for many years. That's not the small town I'm from. Uh, the small town is way smaller. And so when people say like Vashon is a pretty small place to live, 11,000 people is actually, uh, pretty big for me. So uh, community is huge. And uh, I really do love living here, the environment, uh, having my family here. And uh, I just really am grateful to be involved. And, uh, you know, really thank David and uh, Diane for um, really putting this forth and having the involvement from, you know, Mark and John from WSF and the police department, King County. And I hope to contribute as best I can. Thank you, Dustin. It's so great to have you joining us on the board. That's fabulous. I look forward to meeting you at some point. Okay, next on our list of new board members, Jessica Anikar. Jessica, would you join us over here? Hello, um, thank you for your time this evening. My name is Jessica Anikar and I'm a mother of three school-aged children, which are fifth generation Islanders. My family has intergenerationally provided public service for our island and I hope my work as a board member for the Vashon Mori Community Council can continue to promote a community care model and island sustainability while providing supports for all of our island community members. And I also want to thank Diane for the uh, great intention and work that she has put into bringing this together. And I look forward to developing relationships with all of you. Thank you. And we have John Affelter, who is continuing on the board. Hi, this is my uh, just finishing up my first year on the board. Looking forward to my second year. Uh, I'm actually a retired educator administrator a lifelong artist, and I've been on the island for 32 years. And I look forward to this next year. Thank you, John. Okay, that, 
that's our that, that's our that's our board going in and by the way we'll be uh we if anyone is interested in being on the board the board the new bylaws calls for a larger board than we've had so that we can split the work more because it's difficult to get volunteers and it's difficult to get a lot of time so if we many hands make light work and we now have uh a space for 12 board members so if you would like to consider being on the board we would love to hear from you okay so Micaela Olivari was going to be on the continue on the board but she's very regretfully chosen to withdraw for now as she focuses on her food business I did talk to her today and she would love to come back maybe sometime early next year we'll see all right, next we have the Ferry Advisory Committee. There's an opening on the Ferry Advisory Committee. And what we're going to do is uh, we have had a, uh, we have application forms available. If people are interested in, in applying for this position on the Ferry Advisory Committee. And we, uh, the application forms have been, have been emailed out to our mail list and members they're also now on the website if people are interested in taking a look at this and uh, applying and we will be closing the nominations for this position on December 14th and we are planning on having the members of the community uh, vote on who who the person should be so we will we're planning on sharing with everyone who comes to the December meeting the names of the people who have submitted their applications and names and their qualifications no personal details and if they're there they can speak uh, to it and then and then we'll have a vote and uh, determine who's going to fill that position rather than have the board do it we'll bring it to the membership for this decision let's have the membership make as many decisions as possible on things like this. Okay, so that's the plan right now. We do have one application in, and we have another person who would like to apply, and he just needs, I just need to make sure he gets the form. So that's that's where we're at with that. Any questions about that? Okay, not seeing any. Next. Uh, our 2023 proposed budget. John, we're back to you. Um, based on all of the projections that we've been working on, we it looks like our projected budget for this coming year is $1,068. Uh, I have a feeling that we may need to make some adjustments because our board insurance, I've been told I was in contact with some of the other small community councils and um, they are telling me that uh, the insurance companies are unilaterally raising the cost of board insurance, but we won't know that until it comes due, but we may have to have a little cushion there for uh, an extra expense beyond the, the um, uh, let's see, what was that? Yeah, the 735. So we'll see. Uh, but as it stands right now, 1,068 should do it. Um, we currently have on balance $2,385 and two cents. So I'm sharing the screen of the budget that you uh, proposed. And uh, this is our annual meeting, and uh, we are uh, to vote on this budget as a group tonight. So I would like to just have this stop here for a bit. This was, uh, I'd like to know if there are questions about the budget that we have. And uh, also, uh, would you like to mention the fact that there's some grant money in here for 2023? Yeah. Um. I put together a grant for $1,300, a little over $1,300, uh, $1,375 uh, for materials for us to put together a, a functioning uh, Strawberry Festival booth. 
and a booth that we can also put up at other events uh, in the community and, and uh, do some outreach, some information, and also some fundraising. Um, so that uh, it's the uh, it's an annual King County Allen Painter Grant, um, and I'll be putting that in uh, tomorrow. Uh, the grant's completed, and what we're asking for them from them is uh, just a little under fourteen hundred dollars. I'm going to put the budget in the chat. There we go. Okay, so people can look at it more easily. All right. So our uh, projected expenditures for next year are close to 2,900. And uh, that's, that's our budget. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people's hands. And first of all, I'd like to ask if there are any questions for John about the budget. Anyone? Okay. Debbie has a clarification. Would you come up here so people can hear you, please? So it uh, looks to me like we have uh, $2,890 in projected expenses for the budget. And it uh, looks like we have $2,685.02 from the Strawberry Festival last year. Mm -hmm. And then we hope to get a grant yeah. that John's putting in. So that would uh, put us over the expenses. So that would be awesome. Because I heard that uh, there's been a lot of donations by the board members in the past. And uh, I You'd rather hope not I have, have that. that. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, so it depends on how successful our... Our, both our grants and our fundraising efforts will be this next year. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions from anybody? If not, I would like to entertain a motion for this budget to be approved from someone on in the meeting. I'll make that motion. Okay, John has made the motion. Is there a second for? Uh, Deborah's going to second that motion and uh, there hasn't been any discussion so I think we should just go ahead and take a vote all those in favor of approving this budget for next year please raise your hand either electronically or just manually okay and Nick could you help me on the votes please and these uh, will be people who are members can vote on this. If you're not a member yet, you'll have to put your hand down. Okay. I'm counting like 17, Nick. Is that about right? Um, there are some non-member votes in there. Oh, and I also would like to let you know there's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, member votes here in the in the school. So I think we're minus two on the um, on the online vote. So that's fifteen. Uh, fifteen plus John is sixteen. Raised hands. Plus Hunter is seventeen. Considering that's probably a uh, majority of the members here, yes, then I would say that this motion pass passes. Uh, I, I'd like to see a raise of hands who people who are voting against it, just for the heck of it. Anyone voting against the approval of this budget? And I'm going to take. I, I my would own say hand wait, down. wait a while, Diane. Let's get let's let people get their their hands yes. down including you, Nick. Yep. All right, anyone voting uh, against this motion? Not seeing anybody. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. It passed. We're moving on. Okay. <laughs> and this is a time of voting. So next we have as our old business, we have a motion for new meeting days in that will begin in December. So uh, 
The motion is, beginning in December 2022, the dates for the meetings of the Vashon Mori Community Council will be the first Thursday for the board at 7.30 p.m. and the third Thursday for the community at 7 p.m. So uh, is there any discussion? Anyone? That's the motion that was proposed, that was moved and seconded back at the October meeting. And... Uh, uh, now it is up for final discussion and a vote at this meeting, as we always give plenty of time for people to think about these important decisions. Any questions or comments from anybody? Okay. Yes, so very good. So uh, all those in favor of moving to approving this motion and moving to Thursdays for our meetings, please raise your hand. And this would be uh, members, please. Okay, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six of us uh, here uh, in the lunchroom that are voting for it. I'm seeing okay. seven, 17 on the Okay. Zone. That would, I'm sure, pass. So we're me moving. Uh, so any, any votes against? We'll just go ahead and do this. So please take down your hands, including me. Okay, and now it looks like we're ready. Anyone voting would uh, vote against this motion to move our meetings to Thursday? Beverly Skeffington, one one uh, hand against it. And uh, Becca Economopoulos, who left the okay. meeting, but before she left, she sent a uh, chat out that says, uh, throwing in a vote for Monday meetings, I can't make Thursdays. Okay, and I'm not seeing anybody here who is voting against it? They all voted for it. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So the motion passes. We will begin meeting on Thursdays and our first meeting in December will be a board meeting on the 1st of December. And we'll be sending out information now meeting on Thursdays. Okay. Now next is uh, next old business item on the agenda is the progress on the old, the dissolution of the prior community council. So the new council, us have, we gave $300 to the old council for the use of the website, mailing list and the logo. The old council as part of the dissolution plan gave the money to Vashon Household, a 501c3 organization. The articles of dissolution have been submitted to the Secretary of State, and we followed the plan as we have all agreed to, and we're just waiting to hear back. And uh, David, did you uh, uh, take a look to see if uh, we are officially dissolved yet, the VMICC? Uh, Diane, I looked. Um, I couldn't find it uh, listed on the Secretary of State website but I plan to take another look while this meeting's going on and I'll report back before the end of the meeting. Oh, very good. I'm pretty sure it's probably all just gone right on through and they don't even notify you. You just, they just take you off the rolls. So that all, that all happened and, and was uh, done just according to the whole schedule. It all happened very well. Okay, next we have on, on the agenda, a motion for a land acknowledgement. The board voted to include a land acknowledgement at the beginning of every board and membership meeting. And now it's time for the members to vote on this change in our standing rules. The motion that uh, was moved and seconded at the October meeting was, I move that the Vashon Mori Community Council change the standing rules of order to have and to be read at the beginning of each board and council meeting, a land acknowledgement statement. And so it's up for discussion now. It's a, a second time for it's being discussed and we will vote on it tonight. So would anyone like to say anything about this particular motion that's on the floor? Rich. 
please mute, unmute yourself, Rich, and, and share your thoughts. So I would like to be able to vote on this, but I need to be registered as a member of the council. We can do that um, and, tonight, Rich. Well, I've already, while the discussion was going on, I sent in my request for that, but I don't think it's been approved yet. So uh, I might be in the same situation that other people at the meeting are in, which is we care about this, but we may be not eligible to vote. Rich, uh, you have yes, submitted your form. And yes. uh, if are you a... Uh, uh, a resident of Vashon or Maury Island? I am. Okay. And I can tell by your voice, you're probably older than 18. I am. <laughs> and you can see <laughs> my you can see my white hair as well. So there you go. <laughs> and uh see so you live on the island, you're of an age, and um I don't recall that there's much else we need to and we'll yeah, and in, in your form, I'm sure you gave us your mailing list. Your, your mailing address and uh, and uh, probably an email address. No, I did not do all of that. Okay. I did not do all that. Maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't actually register even though I thought I was registering. So. Well, we'll work on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ben, you have a question. Uh, just a clarification before we vote. It's my understanding tonight we're voting on uh, generally the concept of having a, a land acknowledgement at the beginning of each meeting. Right now we don't have a draft in front of us. We're not approving the actual language. That'll be on a second vote on a later date. Is that is that That's right? That's absolutely correct, Ben. We're just uh, tonight. We are just saying that the community council does want to have a land acknowledgement if this vote passes, but the exact wording would be approved later by by the members, by the board and the members, once that once the wording gets out. So the uh, committee uh, did not want to go through the uh, uh, great amount of work it would take to draft and get community input on a specific land acknowledgement until they knew that the community council really wanted one, even wanted one. So that's why it's being done this way. Okay, any other questions or comments on the, on the motion on the floor? Okay, well, I think it's time for a vote then. Um, all those in favor of this motion, I shall read it one more time. I move that the Vashon motion Community Council change the standing rules of order to have and to be read at the beginning of each board and council meeting a land acknowledgement statement. If you uh, approve this, this motion, please raise your hands. So, Nick, there are six of us voting uh, in at the school. Now, 16 on Zoom, 15 hands and one thumbs up. Okay. So um, do we know the exact count of members that we have or that we had uh, or that we have right now? I don't know how many we have right now. We have had 30 members uh, on this uh, at the meeting. And people, people have left. That is correct. Yeah, so it's, I'm sure it's a majority of the members who are with us now, and we do have a quorum still, because once you have a quorum, uh, you have a quorum for the whole meeting. You don't have to have a quorum for each vote. So the motion has passed. And uh, I think it's a lot, of, a lot of people happy about that. And uh, let's go ahead and see if they're, uh, if just for the record, uh, if anyone would like to vote against this measure. Okay, all the hands are down. So if any, anyone would like to vote against this measure, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so it passed unanimously. Okay, next on the agenda, new business. A passenger ferry resolution 
Robert Gibbs is going to introduce this resolution. And Robert, would you like to come and, and read it for us? Come on over here and. Okay. The resolution was motivated by the um, terrible WSF service that we've been getting for the last couple of years on the island. Obviously, a lot of this has to do with the COVID. As the ferry representative said earlier, it has to do also with the shortage of licensed staff. But regardless, um, we're suffering the burdens of the difficulties the ferry system is suffering. Um, and it occurred to me that both King, King County Metro and Kitsap Transit have functioning new um, passenger ferry boats that could, we can make better use of. So this resolution calls for this council to support um, requesting the King County Council and King County Transit and Kitsap Transit to work together to see if they could make better use of the passenger ferries that they currently have so that they can help us get to appointments in town and so that employers on the island have better luck recruiting employees to come over, commute over here because the commute is very disruptive if the boats aren't really functioning. The I, when I was, before I retired a year ago, I was taking the passenger boat to downtown Seattle on a regular basis every day, and it was wonderful. And we really need to use it more. For some reason that I'm not 100% sure of, King County only runs the passenger ferry from here to downtown three times in the morning and three times in the afternoon. There's a huge hole in the middle of the day. So if you just have to go over for a short medical appointment, for example, you're out of luck. You have to take the sea line down to West Seattle and hopefully there's a boat there that'll take you home. Um, it also could be possible for the Kitsap passenger boat to make a stop here on Vashon on its way downtown. And the, the Vashon uh, boat, passenger boat could share the run over to Kitsap County. So those are all technical details that really need to be worked out. There are a lot of complicated negotiations between Kitsap and King County Transit and WSF. But Kitsap County has a much better funding model, fortunately, than um, the WSF does because they, they support their passenger boat with a sales tax increment. So there's a guaranteed revenue source. And they have three passenger boat runs, one from Bremerton, Southworth, and Kingston that travel to downtown Seattle um, 52 times in a, a week. The, the Vashon, or excuse me, that's 52 times in a day between the three runs. Bashan has six runs. And it would seem to me that King County ought to be able to come up with the money to being a much bigger and more better funded entity than Kitsap County ought to be able to come up with the money to run more boats. If not, we should go to the WSF and see if they can be persuaded to help fill the gap here until they can get more boats online. So that's the resolution. Other questions? So Ben has, ben has a question. Ben. Thanks Robert for drafting this. So obviously I, I mean, I want more and, and better ferry service as much as the, as the next guy, but is the request here that King County find the money to pay Kitsap County to run their ferries more often and, and stop by Vashon more often during the day? It's not that specific because we just don't know 
how the funding would work between the two counties. I could see, for example, possibly they split the runs, you know, they alternate the runs some way. They make a triangle out of Coleman Dock, Southworth, and Vashon, just like we have this Coleman, I mean, the Fauntleroy, Southworth to Vashon triangle. There could be another triangle that goes right to downtown. So I don't know who would pay for it or we, who, which entity's boats would be used or maybe they're shared in some way. Okay. I, and it sounds like you had done some research into it. Do you know whether the county level passenger ferries require the same degree of training that like WSF requires for the car ferries? Like, is it going to be 500 plus days to train somebody to run the passenger ferry? And we're going to, we're, we're going to pay for those trained personnel to run these extra lines? Yeah, I asked Justin that question. He said the Coast Guard regulations require the same level of certification. Same, same training, less people. Yeah. The difference is because the boats don't have as many people, you don't have to have as many licensed uh crew on the boat okay we have another question oh hi hi very electric <laughs> <laughs> so correct me if i'm wrong but i believe that 500 days of training is for your mates and masters right that's for the pilot certificate to be the Right. So that's your mates and masters. So the ones that are actually down on the deck or on the passenger ferry, other than the driver, do not take 500 days to train. Your um, uh, able-bodied seamen and your ordinary seamen aren't going to take that long to train. So just so you know, you're not looking at 500 days for every employee that works on the ferry. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I put the I've put the statement in the chat for everybody to take a look at it. And it was also sent to everyone who gets our, who's on our mailing list. So they could also take a look at it, but I think it's important to read it. So if you don't mind, Robert, shall I go ahead and read this? Okay. So uh, here it is. Here's the resolution that we can, we won't vote on it tonight, but we're going to discuss it tonight and vote on it next month. Whereas the Washington State Ferry service from Vashon is uncertain and often significantly delayed, even on the current reduced schedule, and whereas this unpredictable schedule has substantial impacts on Vashon residents who need to travel to Seattle or Tacoma for medical appointments, requiring cancellations of appointments and penalty charges, and or planning for an hours-long trip for a short medical appointment, and whereas King County and Kitsap Transit both have reliable new passenger ferries traveling to Seattle six or eight times a day, but no boats in midday, and whereas a triangle route from Southworth to Vashon to Coleman Dock could be operated with the existing passenger boat fleet without new boats or docks, and whereas it is anticipated that it will take Washington State Ferries another five years to build any new ferries to allow it to operate on a reliable or frequent schedule, now therefore the Vashon Mori Community Council resolves to request that King County Transit work with Kitsap Transit to utilize the existing passenger ferry fleet to provide daily service to Seattle from Vashon and Southworth throughout the day and to seek supplemental funding for this service from Washington State Ferries or other state entities to provide for this service for so long as WSF is unable to provide reliable service throughout the day due to lack of operational boats or crew. There you have it. So um, that's the statement. I would like to uh, entertain a motion to uh, move for this statement to be approved. Okay, Justin has done made uh, approved it, made the motion to to pass this, and I'd like a second for this, please. Okay, and John Affelter has seconded it. So it's been moved and seconded. 
we won't vote on it now. We'll vote on it at the December meeting and have an opportunity for more discussion at that time. Okay. Yes. One other point, Justin and I talked about this a little bit, and it could be that if we could get better passenger boat service, that would take some of the pressure off the Fauntleroy dock. Might not need such big boats, big docks. If the passenger boats were more regular, reliable, and the metro bus connections were better matched up with the, with the passenger ferries, people could see, as I did when I was commuting at a reasonable hour in the morning and the afternoon, take the bus to the boat, walk on the boat, walk off the bus or the boat, take another bus to where you have to go. As long as those things are synced up, it's a no brainer. Thank you very much, Robert, for bringing this to our attention and giving us the opportunity to, to, to do this without having a committee formed for it. Okay, now we're on to open discussion. And I was wondering if anyone has anything they'd like to bring forward in the remaining minutes of our meeting. David, was that a hand up? No. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the issue was raised um, by several people about, um, let's see, the, uh, yeah, the, the post service, the post office has, the service has deteriorated to the point that um, it, it's a serious problem for Islanders island wide. There are very few um, designated drivers for routes. So people don't have packages taken to their home. Many packages are dumped on the side of the road and people are having to go to the post office on a regular basis to just get their um, packages or to complain about the service. And um, it's an unacceptable level of service. The post office is hiring people, but not fast enough to really address this. And so um, I would like to see the community council take a role in trying to um, pressure the Postal Service to hire more people and to address this problem. It, it's, you know, it certainly has been an issue with a number of businesses on the island, you know, hiring workers, but um, the Postal Service is a, a pretty good paying job. So they should be able to hire enough people. Yes, it's a, a very difficult situation that's going on. And if the community council could help in some way, that would be a very good thing. And uh, I know that Allison Shirk uh, sent in some suggestions of things that uh, uh, a committee of the community council could potentially work on. The question is now, who, is, who would like to work on this issue? Well, I could I could do some work on that. Okay, so is there anyone here tonight who would like to join David and Allison? I'm sure Allison would like to work on it as well, since she brought, she put a lot of work and thought into some of these suggestions. Uh, is there anyone else who would be interested in working on this issue? Mike, Mike Dawson. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure. Do we have your email address, your contact details? I don't think so. I, I can give it to you if you'd like it. That would be fabulous, because otherwise we won't have any way to reach you. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> if you could put them in the chat, perhaps, that would be an email or phone number or something like that would be very helpful. I know how to get a hold of David, and I know how to get a hold of Allison. Is there anyone else who'd like to tackle this, uh, help tackle this problem problem in, in its many facets and try to make in some improvement? Anybody I here? See that James Ricard has his hand up, but you can't see it against the color of his painting. Oh, that's what's, oh, that's what's going on. So James, uh, did you want to help as well? 
Actually, my hand was up because I wanted to open up another different topic in the discussion section of the agenda. Oh, okay. oh good. I, we'll, we'll come back to you as soon as we finish this out then. Okay. Thank awesome. you, Jane. Well, it's a start. We got three people to work on this issue and uh, and maybe they'll be able to recruit more when the word gets out that we're looking for folks to, to work on getting our, our post office running more smoothly in some fashion and and the packages and the rest of it, all the different issues surrounding this. Okay, so then I'd like to move on for, because we're running out of time and they're gonna kick us out of here. So uh, James, what would you like to say? It's your turn. Just very quickly, thank you, Diane. Um, Kevin just posted some information in the chat for everybody in terms of approving the change in the bylaws to the land acknowledgement. I wanna thank everybody for that vote. That's fantastic. Um, what Kevin has put in the chat is the date of the next community input meeting. It'll be in the Beachcomber this coming in this week's edition. We had a really good meeting last week, got great input from folks who joined us and just would encourage all of you to either join one of those meetings or encourage your friends and colleagues to join the meeting to provide input so that we get as comprehensive a set of information from people on the island who want a land acknowledgement statement for use by the council so that when we come forward in January, February to the council with the final proposal, the language, we'd really like to have that language really set. And to be very honest and transparent, really would like to uh, avoid a ton of wordsmithing after all of several months of meetings and input from the community. So I encourage everybody to join one of our meetings. Thank you, Diane. Wonderful, thank you, James. And um, Mike, you do have your hand up. Did you wanna say anything more? No, okay. All right, well, is there any, any other topics? We have just a minute left if anyone wants to raise any issues. No, wow, how about that? We actually did it, we did it. It's 8.58 p.m. We covered all those issues in the allotted time and didn't have to cut anyone off. So that was great. Thank you all very much. Now that we have moved to move to Thursday, our next meeting as a community is Thursday, December 15th at 7 p.m. We do not know where exactly that meeting is going to be because we couldn't reserve anything until we knew where we were meeting. And, we're, and this is the first, our very first hybrid meeting for the community council. And uh, we're checking this out to see how well this functions. And uh, I'd like to see how did you, how did it work for the folks uh, at home? How did it work for you guys? Fine. Thumbs up. Okay, worked okay. That we don't really, have a- Really pretty smooth. Pretty smooth. Thank you. I think it went pretty well. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like, well, I'm, it's really important that we uh, do this to me because I want to see as many people as possible be able to attend these meetings, whether they're at home or in a ferry line or wherever. And, and by having it hybrid, it gives us both, both ways of doing it. So I would um, move uh, uh, the meeting be adjourned and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you everybody happy thanksgiving yes happy thanksgiving you too at one point i think we had like uh 40 some people there's a cemetery address oh great and Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you. 